Hello my friends, today's video is finally, and I do mean finally, another ingredients deep dive, but it is a special 3-in-1 today. We've got a video all about three exciting plant ingredients that are very popular in Korean beauty products. As some of you know, the way that we do ingredients deep dives is we take a look at the published literature. What does the science say about these ingredients? And we also talk a little bit about products that contain those ingredients. Now, I'm going to start out today's video with a little bit of an explanation before I get into the research of it just kind of plants. You see, in today's video, we're talking about these three plant ingredients that all have really quite similar claims as far as how they work to make your skin better. They all say they're antibacterial, they all say they're anti-inflammatory, and they all say they're antioxidant. And if you've been at this game of skincare for a while, those three attributes might kind of be a little familiar. Is it even helpful anymore if all plant-based ingredients kind of sound on the surface like they're doing the same thing for your skin? How are you supposed to pick the right ones for you? How are you supposed to pick the right products for your skin's needs? So we gotta start with a basic rule, and that is plants are kind of complex. Each plant has hundreds of things in it, and we as a world acknowledge this every time we say something like a vitamin C is found in oranges, potassium is found in bananas. Those are things that are inside of those, in this case, fruits. So we acknowledge that fruits and also plants have vitamins and minerals, but they also have flavonoids, they have polysaccharides, they have terpenes, and each one of those are a category under which there could be many, many chemicals or constituents. So for example, vitamin A, vitamin D, those are different types of vitamins underneath that vitamin umbrella. And the quantity of those things inside of a plant can be influenced by both external factors, for example, where it was grown, where it was harvested, and also internal factors. What portion of the plant are you looking at? There's a big difference between the leaves, the stem, and the seeds, and I know this is something that a lot of you know. You learned it in college and in botany class, right? That's what you kids are calling it. The reason I'm starting this video with this explanation is because in trying to do some basic research on these ingredients, I ran into a real problem. A huge problem. I saw a lot of articles that were hyper-focusing on just one of the things inside of these plants. If we are talking about the whole plant, and we are in today's video, it's really important that we don't hyper-focus only on one of the constituents. If you're struggling with understanding this, let me give you a quick example. In the process of baking cookies, you use salt in that recipe but are cookies salt? And just like those cookies, plants are complex and made up of all of these different constituents, but they are in no way the isolated constituents on their own. All right, so you see why I had to have that conversation. It was kind of an important framework, right? Now we can move on to the video, and what we're gonna do with each one of these ingredients is we are gonna start with a concept that the community has about what these ingredients do. We're gonna look at the primary literature, and we're gonna circle back around and see if that supports the hypothesis from the skincare community. So let's start out this video with the beautiful lotus plant, also known as Nolumbo nucifera. This is an ingredient that isn't necessarily the most popular in K-Beauty products. However, you may see it here and there. You may know of it from the Primera brand, although they have reformulated this. The bad kind of reformulation, unfortunately, it's got less Lotus in it now? Why would you do this? Why would you do such a thing? After reading through a lot of different Google articles on this one, the conclusion that I came to is that the community sees Lotus as a purifying plant. I don't know if I love that word. I feel like it's not necessarily very descriptive. What does it mean? But what I would tell you is as somebody who went through a lot of bottles of that old Primera Miracle Seed Essence, I felt like it did help with brightening my skin, with maybe helping to keep my acne at bay or calming the inflammation when I did see acne. And with that, let's take a look at the primary literature. Our first study here is Nolumbo nucifera extracts as whitening and anti-wrinkle cosmetic agents. In this study, they saw a reduction in the activity associated with hyperpigmentation. Oh my gosh, there's our potential 
hypothesis as to why people are saying this is brightening. But take a look at this, because this is very interesting. They actually saw different activity depending upon whether they were looking at the leaf, the seed, or the flower. And while it's not a huge difference, we do see that the most of this hyperpigmentation fighting activity is in the leaf portion of the plant. They also looked at elastase inhibition. Now, elastase is the enzyme that breaks down the elastin in our skin. Elastin is, of course, associated with looking more youthful. And yet again, it's the leaf extract here where they're seeing the most activity. Our second study, interestingly, looks at that leaf portion of the plant where we saw the most activity before. They say that Nolumbo nucifera leaf protects against UVB-induced wrinkle formation and the loss of sub subcutaneous fat, which is very interesting. I don't see a lot of researchers look at that, but we certainly do lose fat in our faces as we age. And the mechanism of suppression here is MCP3, IL-6, and IL-8, which are pro-inflammatory cytokines. So we have kind of a lot going on here in terms of seeing what's happening with that anti-inflammatory activity, as well as how this could potentially even be beneficial for anti-aging purposes. So this seems pretty interesting so far, but it does seem like there's something special going on in specifically the leaf portion of the plant. So let's take a look at the constituents for which we have to go over to other studies. We have to find research that has actually looked at what is inside of that lotus. And here we go, we got it through this study. In the flower, we see quercetin, we see camphorol, these are antioxidants. But in the leaf, oh my goodness, we have a lot going on. We have, again, our antioxidant. We have tartaric and malic acids. Those are AHA ingredients. Acetic acid, succinic acid, you may have heard of that one thanks to the inky list. So it seems there's a lot of very interesting potential going on in the leaf portion of this plant. And something else that's really fascinating with lotus is that the leaves, the seed, and the fruit components all have astringent properties, but the whole plant has emollient properties. This is something that can be a bit of a foof moment, right? But it is indeed possible to have a nice balance between those and, in fact, arrive at a conclusion of maybe purifying isn't a bad word to describe lotus. As for a product that contains Lotus, I again would no longer recommend you the new reformulation of Primera as now we have Lotus flower in it instead and it's actually after niacinamide in the ingredients so it's probably pretty low in the reformulation, but I was looking through my collection and I found this one. This is the Pure Lotus Jeju Lotus Leaf Essence. This actually contains 85.5% of Nolumbo nucifera leaf extract. This is something that I received in PR either from YesStyle or Stylevana. I feel so rude for not being able to remember which company sent me this, but I didn't think too much of it at the time. And yet, now that I've read through all of this, I am going to continue to use this product myself. But do note an allergy warning with this product as it does contain some essential oil ingredients. Let's move on to our next plant, which is heart leaf, also known as Hutinia cordata. The word I kept coming across when reading through what others have said about heart leaf is the word soothing, which does happen to carry some significance for all of us with sensitive skin. But is it an appropriate word for heart leaf? Let's take a look at the research. So our first study actually came out quite recently, 2021, in which we see an examination of the photoprotective effects of this heart leaf extract. So that is, of course, referring to how this protects you from UVB damage from our sworn enemy the sun. So that study is giving us some insight into potential antioxidant and anti-aging activity. And in this study, we also see heart leaf upregulating filigrin expression. Now this could be big for a lot of people. A lot of people are looking for ways to boost your barrier function and potentially heart leaf could be an ingredient that could do that. But let's again, once again, go ahead and take a look at the constituents within heart leaf. We're seeing some of those flavonoids again. We're seeing quercetin. We're seeing rutin. That's another very potent antioxidant. And we are also seeing a high presence of polysaccharides. 
Polysaccharides might play a role in helping to hydrate our skin. In fact, you may be familiar with a very common polysaccharide by the name of uh, hyaluronic acid. Can I also point out really quickly that the heart leaf plant contains vanillin as well as methylparaben? This is a channel where we are willing to face issues like that head on. What does that mean? It doesn't really necessarily mean anything. They're just parts of the uh, plant itself. Cookies are not salt. Remember, cookies are not salt. But yeah, methylparaben absolutely exists in nature, and vanillin exists in uh, plants other than just vanilla. But what can we say as a whole? We took the word soothing at the beginning here, and we are looking at polysaccharide humectants. We're seeing barrier-boosting activity and potentially a reduction in damage from sun exposure. Soothing is probably a pretty good word to describe heart leaf. I have no hesitations whatsoever on my rec for this one. This is the Anua Heart Leaf soothing toner, very fittingly named. You all saw me use this in my copper peptides routine. It's a fantastic product with a little bit of other uh, so-called constituents in their isolated form. We have some panthenol in here. We have other antioxidant rich ingredients. It all comes together to make such a gorgeous and very soothing product. Our final plant is mugwort, or should I say our final genus is Artemisia. It's the latter. That's a way to start this section, isn't it? You know you're in for it. You know you are. So here's what makes this one tricky. When people talk about mugwort containing products, they are often talking about the genus of Artemisia and many different species within it. Technically, mugwort would be Artemisia vulgaris, which is found in that April Skin product right there. That is the common mugwort, but I'm From, which a lot of people do seem to know and love, actually uses a different form of Artemisia, which is Artemisia princeps, also known as, surprisingly, both Japanese or Korean mugwort. And then brands like Misha are out here using completely different species underneath this genus. Does all of this matter? Well, Yes, it absolutely does, because like I said in the intro of this video, when you're talking about the plant, you have to talk about the whole plant, and two different species underneath the genus are not the same thing. Think of it like this. If you say, okay, cars and buses are different, but all cars are exactly the same thing, I feel like you're going to make people that own those really expensive cars kind of mad. They'd be like, excuse me, my Ferrari is not a Honda Civic. But like I said, this is an even trickier section. At least let's start with what the common perception of what mugwort products do. I kept repeatedly finding people claiming that mugwort is fantastic for relieving redness in your skin. And that can be a big issue for a lot of people, so big if true. Let's find out if it is. Unfortunately, I kind of noticed a big problem. There's not a lot of literature looking specifically at any of these species in the context of skin. Let's actually start with Artemisia princeps, as you see in the I'm From products. We have a study yet again looking at barrier boosting effects of this Artemisia princeps, or Japanese mugwort. However, something really interesting in this study is that it was pretty dose dependent. Too much of this actually displayed toxicity to the cells, but just the right amount does seem to have an impact potentially on boosting the barrier. Another one of these studies looking at what's actually in this Artemisia princeps identified 192 volatile chemicals and 26 aromatic compounds. And we actually do see some amount of thujone in this, which again, again is technically, uh, technically a neurotoxin. But don't be dismayed. Cookies are not salt. Artemisia princeps is not a neurotoxin. It's interesting that it is in here as well as in wormwood, though. Well, that was Japanese mugwort. What about the common mugwort? Well, that is actually interesting as well. In a different study looking at this specific species, we see the presence of, again, that thujone. We see camphor in this. In quite possibly my absolute favorite paper out of all that I cited today, we see some applications in cosmetology here, which is really, really interesting. Highly recommend you check this one out, if for no other reason than to get to see uh, some of our favorite brands mentioned in this paper right here. Misha, Eastentry, I'm From, Round Lab, Dr. Jart, Tony Moly. But interestingly, the research they're citing isn't looking at the entirety of Artemisia, rather Artemisia vulgaris, common 
in mugwort, and it's in conjunction with a postbiotic ingredient, bacillus. Through that, they say you can see an anti-aging and anti-wrinkle effect, and then they also talk about the applications of this, how it can be used for skin conditioning and perfuming. The essential oils are a big part of Artemisia. And that's what we have as far as Artemisia. Now this is where it gets really tricky, doesn't it? So coming back around to uh, does it help with relieving redness? Well, strictly looking at peer-reviewed published literature, there isn't a lot to support that claim. But does that mean that it doesn't? Well, no, unfortunately it doesn't, especially given that we're talking about a plant with honestly so little research looking at the way that it affects the skin. This is why we as a skincare community sometimes do have to rely on anecdotal experiences, and there are a lot of anecdotal experiences with both of these masks that I have out here. Excuse me, I have a mask and a cream. So it really comes down to what you are looking for. Are you looking for published literature and making a decision on what products to use? To be honest with you, you may want to wait a bit on the Artemisia genus. But on the other hand, are you interested in just what works? You may want to read through some of the reviews because there are again some very compelling reviews for both of these products. This video is just me going through the research. I highly encourage you, if you have any experience with mugwort or with the other ingredients we talked about, feel free to share your experience in the comment section below. Do you feel like what you have seen through these products containing these ingredients matches what we talked about today. And with that, we have arrived at the end of today's video. I hope this was helpful for you. Again, I do have all of my citations in the description box below, as well as links to these products if you are interested in checking them out. If you found today's video helpful, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. Have a fantastic rest of your day, and I will see you all next time.